Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good to see you all, and welcome to uh, church. If you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 32. If you want to take notes, you can do so in the weekly updates that you receive when you came in. Um, or you can go ahead and go to the Version Bible app. That thing's pretty awesome, isn't it? Go there. A lot of you are going there, and uh, we're like, oh, I guess we don't need as many weekly updates anymore. But uh, you can go there. You can find our, uh, our list under the events section, Northeast Christian Church. So let me go ahead and open up and uh, start off by answering the, the biggest question that you all have for me concerning my absence from the pulpit for the last two Sundays. Yes, Bon Jovi is awesome in concert, okay? Like, the best, the best. Ah, I mean, it was like the greatest thing ever and um, a best show ever. I mean, he's 56 years old and still rocking, okay? That guy's got it going on. Um, it was absolutely amazing. Oh, and then there was that whole eye surgery thing. Um, yeah, that stunk. I'm not going to lie. So I don't, I'm not going to go into details, but let me just put it this way. Uh, walking into the surgery center, I, I looked to my wife and I said, hey, uh, I really think uh, cornea reconstruction surgery sounds a lot worse than it actually is. And she said, probably. And then I walked out and I said, I was wrong. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot worse than it sounds. And, and the, the procedure wasn't really bad. I mean, the, the actual surgery wasn't bad. It was afterwards. Man, it was, it was ridiculous. It was, it was a bit painful. Recovery is kind of painful. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to be back, and I'd like to go ahead and say thank you to Mr. John Van Dyke. Two weeks in a row, right, everybody? <laughs> Appreciate you so much, sir. I was, watching, I was watching last Sunday from home in my bed. That was nice. Alive on Facebook, on Facebook Live, I was watching at home in my bed, and uh, John stood up here and said, man, writing a sermon two weeks in a row is hard. And if you go back in those laws, you can look at me going, yes, it is. That's right. And so, but uh, John, my friend, thank you very much. I appreciate you so much. Um, you don't mind? I'll go ahead and take it from here. You good? All right. Um, but let me give you guys a little warning before I get started. Um, I, haven't, I haven't written a sermon in two weeks. And, uh, and, and I don't know if the eye thing did something. The surgery, they maybe went a little too far. So I think it might have messed up my mind a little bit. Um, <laughs> but my mind was like a little bit jumbled. If you saw me on, if you saw me on Tuesday, right, which actually some of you did, I was a little bit of a mess and, and things were not clicking. And then all of a sudden something happened. And I'm going to be honest, my mind, I feel like is a, was a jump is, is a little bit of a jumbled mess. And so, um, this sermon, in my opinion, is a bit of a jumbled mess, but let's just go with it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Enjoy. Um, how many of you, how many of you would say that you tend to overthink things? So, yeah, all right. For those of you that aren't raising your hands, liars, okay, we, we overthink things, don't we? Overthinking is exactly what it sounds like. You see that you, you think too much about something or for too long and uh, overanalyzing things too. We overanalyze stuff, all right? Relationships is probably the number one thing that we that we overthink, that we that we overanalyze. There was this movie um, with Mike Myers, and it was called the uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer. Any of you all remember this movie? One of my favorite movies of all time, right? Mike Myers plays a character, and this fella he he would overthink every single one of his relationships, you know. And he he had great reason. He had great reason to break up with all of those girls because Jill was in the mafia. Pam smelled like soup, and, and, and Betty stole his heart and his cat, okay? And so he would break up with them, and then he would write poems about them. And so he had all these really great reasons to, to break up with all those girls. He, but he was always overthinking things. And I think we, we do that. This, was a, this movie was, it was us. We would overthink our relationships because what's the number one question I get from people in ministry? I always get, how do I know when they're the one? And I'm like, man, it's actually a lot easier than you think. You're overthinking stuff because, listen, this is how it works. When you choose them and they choose you, congratulations, you found the one. That's how it works. All right? Yeah, but we overthink things. You know, like, wait, wait what, did, what did they mean when they said, I'll see you later? I'm pretty sure they meant they'll see you later. Well, what, what's with that look on your face? This is just my face. That's not a look. Why are you winking all the time? I just had eye surgery. All right, back off. <laughs> but we overthink 
We overthink our relationships. Uh, we overthink our uh, failures. We overthink our failures. We go ahead and we overthink our mistakes, going over every painstaking detail about what we did wrong. Why, why didn't I get the job? I mean, chances, don't overthink it. Listen, chances are the reason you didn't get the job is, I mean, they wanted to hire someone else. It's okay. Maybe they were better qualified. I mean, as long as you didn't go into that job wearing like a, a shirt cut off here and a Budweiser in your hand, you know, it, might not, it might not have been anything you did. It's just that, you know, hey, maybe somebody was better qualified than you. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. You know, I mean, we, we make mistakes in our relationships or with our friends. You know, maybe, you know, well, why did I say that to my best friend? And you, you kind of go over and over. You're like, you probably shouldn't have told him that that outfit made him look fat. I mean, that's kind of mean. All right. Listen, don't overthink it. Just don't do it again. All right. Just, just be that way. You know, or why did the relationship not work out? I thought I just covered that, folks, because they didn't choose you. Move on. Go find someone else to choose. Don't overthink it. But I think that's what we're doing. I think we do that a lot. And one of the areas that we do the most in is spiritually, specifically with God's word. I think we overthink God's word a lot. And it's, it's exceptionally true when it comes to the parable. Okay, what do we say about parables? This is what our whole thing is. We're about talking about the storyteller, and, and the storyteller would tell these stories. We call them parables in a parable. The traditional kind of definition here is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. With a heavenly meaning. Now, sometimes those, meaning, those meanings were obvious. I mean, you'd hear it and you go, that makes sense. I know exactly what that means. And sometimes you would hear it and it was, it was a hidden meaning. Like, he, he wouldn't tell you, all right? He would, he would tell you the, the story, and then he would just walk away. And you're like, good luck with that, okay? So sometimes they were obvious, and, and, and sometimes they were hidden. Sometimes he would tell you. Sometimes he wouldn't tell you what they meant. But sometimes they were obvious, and they still didn't understand what they meant. I mean, they're sitting there, literally, they're sitting there saying, what in the world did he mean when he said what, what, whatever it was? Whatever the story. What in the world did he mean when he said when the truth is, it was obvious. It was very obvious. And I think today's parable that we're going to go over fits that category. Fits a category where people overthink it. As a matter of fact, when I told Donald, I said, Donald, I'm, I'm doing the, the mustard seed. He's like, uh, how are you doing a mustard seed? Man, that's going to be a rough one. Why? Because that's my impersonation of Donald. It's pretty... Spot on, right, Donald? He's like, man, I don't sound like that. <laughs> um, but he's like, how are you going to do that? That's a rough one. Like he, and he even said, we were hanging out at the, at the baseball game Thursday night, and he's like, hey, how are you going to do that? Where are you going with that? I don't even understand. I was like, well, let me tell you. And he's like, okay, there we go. Um, but I think this parable um, fits right in that category of overthinking, overanalyzing. Listen to what it says, all right? Matthew 13, verses 31 through 13. He told them another parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it comes to growth, it is as large as the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds come and perch in its branches. All right, so I got a, I got a mustard seed right here, and that's it. And the question is, how in the world does someone overthink something like that? All right, how in the world does something overthink something so tiny? Like I'm holding it in my hands and you guys can't even see it, okay? But how do you overthink something like that? Well, let me tell you, very simply, because there are two thoughts to this parable. There are two thoughts to this parable. The first one, there's a majority and then there's a minority. The majority one goes like this, that this is a picture of the church from the beginning and its growth throughout the, the span of time how it covers the world as, a, as a, a center of hope, a center of refuge for all mankind. So it starts small and it grows into this enormous, this enormous thing, this enormous, beautiful thing. It's, it's a beautiful picture of the growth of the church. And that's what the majority of people ascribe this parable to. Adam Clark, he writes it in his commentary. He says, both these parables, he's talking about the one that's right after it as well. He says, they're, they're prophetic. And we're intent to show principally how, from very small beginnings, the gospel of Christ can pervade the nations of the world and fill them with righteousness and truly holiness. 
And so like the, 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 par- the, the majority think that this parable is very simply meaning that it's a picture of the beautiful growth of the church. Starting with one man sacrificed on the cross, Jesus Christ sacrificed on the cross, and it spreads globally. It's salvation to the entire world. It becomes a refuge for all mankind. That's the majority. Now, the minority, this is what they think, all right? This is how they, they say, this is actually a picture of the corruption of the church, okay? It's a picture of corruption of the church. It's it's how the church grew in the very beginning, and and when it came into the decades and centuries after the Christianization of the Roman Empire, they're talking about corruption, all right? And they're saying that because this little fellow right here, this little mustard seed, I got two there, all right? This little mustard seed right here, um, it's not intended to get that big. It's not intended to grow into a tree. It's supposed to be like a bush. It's just supposed to grow into like a little bush. I mean, a pretty good sized bush, but still, it's not intended to get that big. It's, it's unnatural growth. And so the, the, the commentators and the, the scholars, they all sit back and they go, well, this can't be a beautiful picture of the growth of the church because that's not normal. That's not normal. That's not natural. I mean, it has to be the absolute perfect conditions for it to get over a certain size. It has to be absolutely perfect. So this isn't supposed to happen. Since it's not supposed to happen, then this can't be a beautiful picture of the growth of the church. This is a picture of corruption. It's a picture of corruption. It's, it's supposed to be smaller, and it's, it's supposed to be the size of a bush, so, so small that, that birds can't put their nests in the trees. What about these birds? Don't get us started on the birds. The birds are a big problem. I'm not going to lie. All right? The birds are a huge problem. Why? Because here's the deal. Birds are a sign. They're a sign in the Old Testament of evil and the devil, emissaries of Satan. That's what they are. Like they're sitting back there like, you know, here's the deal. Like one, one, commenter, says, one commentator says this. He says, birds lodging in branches most probably refers to the elements of corruption which takes refuge in the very shadow of Christianity. Let me, let me go ahead and point out the certainty here right here. Next, next slide here. Most probably. Pretty confident in what he's saying, right? He says, most, most probably it could be a sign of the corruption of the church because these birds. And so, it, 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 you know, here's the deal. In the Old Testament, there were, there were symbols. They were symbols of, of evil. They were symbols of, of you, know, you know, the devil and Satan. And actually, in verse 4, this very chapter, they are used in an instance where they're taking their, their, their emissaries of Satan who are, who are picking the seeds off the ground. Mind you, the, the seeds, if you go back to that parable, the seeds are thrown in the wrong place, okay? But that's the picture of the birds. And so they're sitting there going, no, 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 no. This, this tree grows unnaturally, and these birds are, are in it. It's a sign of corruption that's not supposed to be there. And, and I'll be honest with you. Like, here I am studying this, and I've studied it for years, and, and I'm studying it here again this last week. And I'm sitting there, and I'm reading, and I'm like, it's eh, a pretty good argument. This whole unnatural growth thing and these whole bird things, yeah, I guess they are symbols of, evil it's a pretty good argument it might be and i thought to myself at one point i thought to myself this this actually this actually might be spot on but then i start going okay let's let's go back what is what is i start thinking you know uh the seeds represent this the you know what does the field represent okay well, what about all these other garden plants that are there we don't even talk about the other garden plants but what about all those garden plants and everything like that what are the significance uh, what are the branches significant of okay better yet what's the kingdom of god what, i mean literally what are they referring to when they say the kingdom of god you know and so i start questioning all this stuff and i start overthinking everything until point i go damn it I think so. Sometimes, sometimes a bird's just a bird, right? Actually, I want you to write that down. Sometimes a bird's just a bird. You know, I want you guys to, like I said, I'm going to be jumping all over the place, just pulling points from this, this passage of Scripture, but I think this is an important point right here because sometimes we tend to overthink things. I want you to remember this. Next time you start overthinking something, your relationship, all right, your job, your relationship, you know, your, your church, your God, Scripture. Next time, just go, sometimes a bird's just a bird, all right? 
Don't overthink it. Because uh, last time I checked, birds like trees, <laughs> okay? It's kind of normal for them to put a nest in a tree, right? Yeah. Is that bad? No, I don't think so at all. Sometimes a bird is just a bird. And, and, and I look at this passage of Scripture, and I'm like, you know, here we are trying to say it's this sign picture of corruption. The truth of the matter is I, I wholeheartedly believe, like, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful picture of the growth of the church. It starts from nothing, becomes everything, and spreads to the entire world, becomes this, this giant tree of refuge for all mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes a bird is just a bird. It's okay. Because just as many times, and here's the deal, we can come up with all these arguments for corruption, and we can say these are the symbols, and this is what it means, and this is where it comes from. And we can, but here's the deal, we can make just as many arguments in the opposite direction as well. I mean, listen, Jesus, Jesus told every single one of you, don't worry, right? He said, don't worry. And what did he compare you to? The birds of the air. He literally said, he says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will hear, wear. It's, it's, it's not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet the heavenly Father feeds them. He says, listen, maybe stop worrying and be like the birds of the air. You know, those evil emissaries and everything like that. Let's be like them. Be like those guys. Be like the evil emissaries. And what about this unnaturally large bush tree we got going on here that starts with this little tiny, there it is, this little tiny seed. What, what about this thing right here? Can I ask you guys a question? What is natural about the growth of the church? Like, can you explain anything that's natural about the growth of the church, the beginning of the church? Because, see, the last time I checked, um, it's not natural for someone to speak in a language that they don't know. But that's what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came down upon the disciples. That's not natural. It's not natural for a guy who doesn't speak in front of large crowds or anybody. It's not natural for this guy to stand up in front of thousands upon thousands of people, tell them how wrong and dumb they are, then say, repent and be baptized, and they all go, okay. That's not, listen, listen, if I stand up in front of thousands of people and, and deliver the same message that Peter delivered, if I stood up in thousands of people and I wasn't invited, like they didn't say, hey, Justin, can you come up and speak? Because Peter was not invited to speak. If I stood up in thousands, from thousands of people and said, hey, y'all are dumb and messed up, repent and be baptized, guess what? I'm getting beaten off that stage. It's not going to go over well. Last time I checked, walking on water wasn't normal. Last time I checked, turning water into wine is not normal. Last time I checked, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't natural or normal to, to heal somebody with a touch or even just words. It wasn't natural to, to, to be dead for three days and then raise up to life again. I mean, if you're looking for normal and natural, close your Bibles. Think about this for a second. What you, it is not normal what we're doing right here, right now. This is not natural. It's your day off, folks. It's your day off, yet you're here. You're here, and you come, and you, you sing songs together. Every single one of you are different. Like, look around. Look around at everybody, okay? You guys are all different. You come from all different walks of life. We, we, some of you are night, some of you are day. We're opposites. Yet we'll all come here and sing with one voice. Listen to an overly hairy guy talk about the most ancient of pieces of literature ever. Man, there ain't nothing natural about that. So I want you to write that down as well. There's nothing natural about the church. There's nothing natural about the church. There's nothing natural about its growth. But I believe that's what makes it so beautiful. That's what makes it so beautiful. It's unnatural. It's supernatural. But then there's this other thing that bothers me. I mean, it probably bothers me the most, okay? 
um, why people think this is a, a picture of corruption. It, 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 like, it seriously bothers me. I'm going to be honest. It seriously bothers me. And there's this one part um, later on, Matthew chapter 17. And then we're going we're gonna to jump back between Matthew and Mark, okay, because they're the same story. But, but here's the deal. A man, he goes to Jesus, and Jesus is going to use the mustard seed again here. But Matthew, in Matthew 17, there's this man, and he goes to Jesus, and, and he says, Jesus, heal my son. His son is possessed by a demon. He says, heal my son. He's been like this since, you know, he's been a child. Please heal my son. And, 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 and here's the deal. In 17, this is where we're going to jump into Mark, all right? Um, he record, because Mark records something that I, I think every single one of us need to hear this morning. That's what happens, all right? Let me read it. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And he says, you see that? Did you, you see that? If you can do anything, what does Jesus say? He says, if you can. He's like, you know, if you can, what do you mean, if, if I can? What do you mean, if I can? And Jesus said, everything is possible. For one who believes. And as he says that, like there's and, and notice what the word says. It says immediately. Like there's there's no there's no there's no time gap. Like immediately, as soon as Jesus says, anybody who believes, he says, the man looks at me and says, I do believe, but he says, What? Help me overcome my unbelief. How many of us? would say that right there. Help me overcome my unbelief. I know I did. I I say that all the time. Help me to overcome my unbelief. Like, I I believe, but help me in those times and those areas where I don't believe, where I struggle, where it hurts, where where it doesn't make sense to me. Help me in that area. And Jesus recognizes what's going on with this father. This dad is on his knees. His baby boy is being tormented and tortured every day of his life, and he's begging Jesus. The disciples couldn't do anything. He took him to the disciples, and, and they couldn't do a single thing. He says, help him, please. Help me to overcome my unbelief and, and help my son. And, and Jesus recognizes what is going on. He, it's this right here. It's just a, it's the tiniest bits of faith. It's just that big right there. And he helps him. He heals his son. He heals his son. He helps him to overcome his unbelief. After this happens, um, the, the disciples come and they come to Jesus and they're confused. They're confused. They're like, why in the world could, could we not do what you just did? Why, why couldn't we do what you just did? And Jesus replies to him. He says, because you have so little faith. He says, you have little faith. Their faith wasn't even this right here is what he says. He says, he says truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as what? A mustard seed. You can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This is all it took faith-wise. On behalf of that father, for his son, this was all it took faith-wise. And so you see how I have a hard time thinking this is about the corruption of the church. Because in truth, and in, in truth, what this is a picture of is, is how, how the Father and his unbelief, the mustard seed, this is a picture of great things start with small beginnings. That's what this is. This is a picture of how great things start with small beginnings. I want you to write that down because that's what Jesus is talking about with the mustard seed, the parable of the mustard seed. That's what he's talking about with, with the father and his unbelief, his struggle with unbelief. That's what he's talking about. Great things start, all right, with small beginnings. All music, here's the deal. All music comes from the octave, from these eight notes. Like if you think about it, all styles of music that you listen to, every hymn that we have comes from those eight notes. 
every single hymn, every country song, every jazz song, every easy listening song, which is a thing, every rap and hip-hop song, every rock and roll anthem that is out there comes from just that octave. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Better yet, every single piece of literature is built on 26 letters. Have you thought about that? Every book, every speech, every, every, every law, everything, every written document, every library is built, no matter what the size, is built on just 26 letters of the alphabet. It's amazing, isn't it? America. Ship sails from England, December 11th, 1620. 101 people on that boat. And from, there, there were other boats that sailed out and held thousands of people, but you got this little boat that has 101 people on it, and the next thing you know, America. Small things. Great things come from small beginnings. So when Jesus evokes the parable of the mustard seed, when he, when he goes ahead and he, he points to his disciples and he says, you know, the, the kingdom started small but it is going to grow. It was, it was an encouragement. It was words of encouragement. He was saying, it's going to grow. It's going to grow into something. It's going to be a refuge for all mankind, for every generation from here on out, and even in the past. It's a, it's a refuge for all mankind. Great things come from small beginnings. And that was Jesus' point when he evokes the parable of the mustard seed, when he talks about the unbelief of the Father and the, the faith that moves a mountain. He says, that's, what he's talking about. But as you say all that, here's the deal. As, as, you, as you say all that and you go there, there's got to be this other question that has to pop up in your mind. What about this whole mountain moving faith thing? Have you guys not thought about that? Like you say, you know, if you have this much faith, and, and honestly, all of you are going, I think I've got, I think I got about that much. <laughs> all right? Um, what about this whole mountain moon faith thing? What does that look like? Here's what I think. I think I'm staying up here right now looking at a congregation full of mountains. That's what I think. Young people, I want to ask you to do something. I want you to find an old person in this church. Okay. And I want you to ask them, what was your faith like when you first accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I guarantee you, every single one of them will say this right here. It was like this. It was barely anything. It was barely, barely anything. There was barely anything here. And, and, and if you're a person that somebody comes up to you and, and asks, what was your faith like? And you're like, wait a second, what does that mean? That means you're old. Welcome to the club. Okay, but this is how every single one of our faith starts off. Like, like we weren't we weren't one hundred and ten percent certain about anything. We started off right here, and then we were like, I, I think so. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. Like, listen, I, I'm I'm the chief one here, man. I'll tell you what. Um, I'll be the first to tell you that this is what my faith looked like when I first got started. This little, this little seed right here. Because I got to ask that question. I got to ask that question. Do you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? You know what I said? I go, yes? It sounded like I almost asked the question back. Okay? And they were like, we can work with that. Because this is where my faith was. Because that day, all right, over 20, gosh, 20 years ago, when I said, yes, I could not tell you I was going to be right here right now. That I'd be preaching God's word. That I'd be entrusted with the care of a congregation. I couldn't have told you that way back then. That was nowhere in my picture. It was nowhere in my mind because I'll tell you what, I didn't see any of that. Because my faith was, was, was it, I, I, I doubt it more than I believed. 
My, my doubt way, way outweighed my belief. My doubt was obese. That's what it was, okay? It was a lot. I would argue against it. I would argue against God. I would argue against the Bible. I'd be the first one to tell you that I didn't believe it. Over and over and over again. I would argue all day long. I would deny all day long. I would make fun of people like us. I would do that. I'll admit it. I would, I'll admit I was the biggest mountain to move. But even as much as I doubt it, and even as stubborn as I was, and as even as much as I denied and I argued, I will honestly tell you there was always this. The tiniest bit of faith. Because here's the deal. I, I wanted to believe. I really did. I wanted to believe so bad. And so when I said yes 20 years ago, that right there is where I start. Today, yes. Yes, 110% yes. Everything I have, yes. That's, that is where it grows to. This is, this is more. This is more. This is where it starts. You know what? All right, I'm not even going to, we're not going to, I'm not going to say anything else. All right, here's the deal. I'm done preaching. I'm going to illustrate real quick, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, this is my friend Kristen. Many of you know her. Before I left for my little thing, uh, we sat down and had a wonderful talk about life, about her. I talked about myself a lot too. We talked about God. We talked about his word. And, uh, this one right here, she was one of my ones. I've been praying for her big time. And I know a lot of you were too. Hold your hand up. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Mountain moved. We're going to go get ready and get baptized, okay?